questions from the Tony side? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. We are Team Six, and we have the topic of gesture driven presentation. My name is Tomasz. This is Antonio, Niklas, Raspan, and Rodrigo. So, without further ado, let's go to the next slide. Yes, I did it. I used this pointing device, even though our topic says exactly gesture driven presentations. But we have certain reason for that why we did that. And later on, we'll show you everything. There will be some nice demo, so stay tuned. Okay, going by there, there are already a lot of presentation guided, for instance, there are one as I'm holding in my hand right now. But our objective is to be <coughs> on them entirely, to be just ourselves when presenting, to use as much of gesture as possible, because there are small power experience as a user with respect to performing the presentation, like for instance, the one now. So, we are going to enter our motivation, and it's as follows. We wouldn't like any additional equipment to require because it might cause problems. Sometimes it might you know, stop working, sometimes the battery might be worn off. We would like to provide more natural interaction. And also, what we have developed for the purposes of this project might be within the, uh, within the interest of all the researchers, say, activity recognition, translation of sign languages, for instance, the one done by Microsoft, or virtual or augmented reality. And there are already existing solutions in state of the art which can perform that without any extra devices, so based only on gestures of human, but these are also really complex devices, for instance, depth sensor as Kinect or infrared cameras. So our question is how far can we get, or rather should I say, how low we can get? What is the minimum possible device which could uh, provide us with performing nice gestures to uh, control the flow of the presentation? And this, on the other hand, brings us to the research question. And first of them is, is it actually possible to accurately and robustly identify human gestures if they use only on single ordinary web camera? Furthermore, is it possible to do it even when the background is cluttered or dynamic? So when it's actually quite disadvantageous with respect to just the gestures. And last but not least, can we just use the single classifier, let's say SDM, or do we really need to perform deep learning approach in order to accomplish that? There was one way to find out. Uh, my colleagues will explain you later on what we develop, but now I would like to provide you with a quick recap of our previous phases and uh, uh, our previous attempts from previous uh, work. So we collected a lot of data via recording, as you can see, for various arm gestures. So you can see going with your hand right, uh, going to, uh, to the next slide, going for instance with your left hand to the previous slide, starting and stopping presentation, or Reset the presentation when I say increase it, I mean uh, going to the very first slide, so start presentation from the very beginning. Uh, then we use the uh, open post library and we extracted points gathered from these videos and the points are, for instance, right wrist, leg wrist, elbows, uh, shoulders, etc. And then, having extracted them, we put them all in one single image and this is what we end up with at the end of the phase two. You can see it's just one result of uh, all the frames put together <coughs> and already gathered all the reads, extracted them and processed them appropriately. It will be more elaborated later on. And uh, my friend Nicholas will tell you more when it comes to data processing and in general about time gestures. Um, we also used uh, an approach of simple heuristics, so no learning, just registering key points by uh, uh, analyzing two adjacent frames. It was simply about extracting key points of right wrist, left wrist, and then measuring the distance over them. Something simply working, it was also already presented during the phase two. And we are also dealing with hand gesture analysis. And to put it really, really in short, briefly, it was as follows. At each frame, do the following file time. So extract uh, certain uh, key points, say wrist, then segment out the region of the hand. And detect whether it is fun or not using an SVM classifier which has been trained beforehand. So, we have uh, multiple <coughs> concepts for today. So, we would like uh, uh, just to show you what is our project structure. And uh, what we are doing during the project was uh, arm gesture detection techniques. So, there were heuristics based, cross correlation based, and over and other based. And we also do with uh, arm gesture detection. We also performed evaluation to see what is good, what is bad, what could be improved. And what which option is most uh, uh, like uh, most better perceived by you? And now I pass in course to the new class. So yeah, I am talking about the data processing. Maybe as a quick reminder, of what we have done yet is uh, we gather, gather, gather the open post key points from the videos. We set a specified <coughs> frame rate, for example, seven frames per second. 
uh, we scale the values based on the time. So the brightest values you see here are the current frame, and the darker the value gets, the less uh, the, the more far behind it was. So this was four frames behind. Um, and we also did normalization to so we can stand where we want in the in the frame and don't have to be standing on specific spots or micro move. Um, yeah, more on the normalization thing. We have the image here of the body 25 that are all possible key points that we can use. And you know, for the normalization, we reach at the center of the coordinate system to 0.1, so in the center of the shoulder, so right here. Um, yeah, to give this positional independence, so we really can move where we want. And we rescale the coordinate system such that a value of one means that this is the distance between the shoulders, so between point two and five. So we can move far uh, to the front and back without getting different values. So it's always the same, no matter where you are. It helps us processing. So what we did now was we interpolated between the key points. You can see here. Um, in this image, we only used the wrist key points because yeah. That basically all people we use. <laughs> um, we did linear interpolation because yeah, it's enough. We don't need some cubic or spine interpolation. And um, yeah, it gives us the information of all frames that are between us. Even if we have a frame of three frames per second or seven frames, it doesn't matter. If we, as long as we gather around one second of frames, we always have the information of one second. But not, not the matter on the frame rate. So this helps us too. After that, we perform data filtering. So, as you can see, um, without filtering on the far left, the glasses are kind of mixed, so not that good. After filtering, but without augmentation, um, at least the blue and the yellow glasses are quite good separated. But after augmentation, and then we did some augmentation to really get more data over fil filtered glasses to better train with it. And the augmentation is another. Figure for augmentation on the left, you see two original matrices. Um, and from this two matrices, we did this nine augmented matrices. We did zooming or tilting the, the image just to get more information, to get more training data, and to get uh, more interesting training data because we had to filter out the bad training. So, yeah. So, now I'm going to start with our first arm gesture recognition approach that was heuristics based. The problem with heuristics is it's quite tedious to do them, and it's hard to make them robust and precise at the same time. So, and quite natural. So, it's really easy to do something like this. You have big movements because you don't do it when you're talking. But small movements are really hard to do because you mix it up really fast with just normal talking. Uh, we started off with just checking the difference in the real position that looked like this. So, we took one point, took the other frame. Calculate the distance it was traveled for example 200 in this example, and if it exceeds a certain threshold, we just say it was a gesture for whichever arm did this distance. What we then did was we moved it to the normalized space to get all of our bunches of the normalization thing, so we can stand anywhere in the image, and we can stay, yeah, we can stand anywhere, and it gives us a nice bunch of the so-called zero crossing. So we call it zero crossing. So we always know if a hand travels beyond your middle of your body, if it's had the same time zone, which can help us um, see the gestures because you can really easily define if you travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the next thing we did was we used more than one frame. Currently we well, before we use only one frame. So the information was different we get <laughs> if we have a different frame rate. So three frames a second or different frames a second. Yeah. Less time. So we have a dynamic. We have a dynamic window of frames now with around one second of frames, and um, now we get always the same information with the interpolation, and we really can compare uh, start and end positions around one second. But we still have a problem if we don't face the camera. So if we stand like this, the distance between the shoulders and the two D plane is very small, um, which makes a mess for like movements if you're pointing on a slide. It's a really big value that comes out there. And to handle this, we use an upper bound. So we, yeah, if, a, if the value exceeds a certain threshold, it doesn't count anymore as a gesture because you don't. If you don't do this, you don't want to change the slide because you want to point it. Yeah, and that's all about heuristics. 
So another technique that we use uh, is called cross correlation. <coughs> it's also called the sliding dot product. Um, it is used usually for uh, measuring the similarity between <coughs> signals, but we can also use it in a um, computer vision. So how it works? We have what we call the template and the scene, and we take the template and we just like put it on the image several times, and at the end we reach an image like this one. And as you can see, there's the, the white dot here where it tells you like, okay, if you put the template in that position, is when you are going to find uh, <coughs> what you want. Um, then um, this was going. It's a, it's a convolution process what we're doing, and it was being very slow. It was taking uh, zero point two seconds for each operation. So we we said like, okay, let's try to use Fourier. Then convolution becomes a multiplication that you do inverse uh, Fourier transform, and this speed up the computation six thousand two hundred percent. So it allowed us to use really this in a correct way. <coughs> Uh, so we have a reduced data set of gestures where, where we're going to like compare, and then this is going to be our template. So uh, the small images, um, this one is a template, and um, this one is a correct gesture, this one is an incorrect gesture. And we can see here how the white dot is in the middle, and here it's uh, not in the middle, so this is not a correct one. So how do we choose if a gesture uh, is done or not? We use two methods. First, uh, we calculate the peak distance to the center and the magnitude group by gestures. And then, if uh, we take the peak with the smallest average distance to the center, and that's going to give us one gesture. And then we take the peak with the highest average magnitude, and that's going to give us a second gesture. If both of the gestures are the same, then they're agreeing, and we will decide that we did a gesture. If not, we will just discard it, and it's like we're just talking normally and not doing anything. The last uh, method that we use uh, in the, is a an autoencoder, color, and then I will explain a classifier also. So most of you know already how an autoencoder color works. You have an encoder, it takes your, your original data to a latent space, then you decode, and you try to get the original information. This is usually done for like abnormal detection, for example. So you train your autoencoder with what you use your normal data, and then like uh, in real time, once, when you see something that you didn't see during the training, you get a big uh, reconstruction error, and you can say, okay, this is something abnormal, let's say. So why are we using this? Because we didn't know when to detect that a gesture was starting. So we decided to train the autoencoder only with gestures, so that in real time, when you're not doing them, you're just speaking and um, yeah, <laughs> uh, you will get a big reconstruction error, and then you just discard it. Uh, but then we also realized that uh, the mean square error that we use for training uh, is not that good for real time, so we went for a, what we call a pixel based error. Also, um, another important fact of uh, encoders is that they reduce the dimensionality, so it helps for the classifier. Uh, we also have to decide the architecture of the autoencoder, like how big are we going to make it? Is it going to be out deep autoencoder or not? And so we first started with like simplest one, just input, latent space, output. And uh, here we can see the graph that uh, after 100 nodes in the latent space dimension, it doesn't improve at all. Um, and then we decided to add another layer after that. Uh, so input 100 nodes, another layer, to try to compress it a bit more, and then again decode. And we saw that it doesn't improve. Like it's actually worse performing than previously. So we decided to just uh, have uh, the simplest one with 100 nodes in it. And then we have the classifiers. Again, we're using a simple architecture, and we have to decide how big or not. So the first one is a 100 nodes to four nodes, and using softmax, each of them is going to tell you the probability that the input is uh, in one class or another one. And so we can see like a kind of like nice string loss. Uh, but again, it was a bit big, so we decided like okay, let's try to make it bigger and see what happens. So we introduce a layer between the 100 and four. And we investigated from uh, 0 to 200. And we saw that it doesn't improve anything. And so why having a bigger network if uh, it doesn't improve? Uh, and as I said before, we use the latent space as input because when you have images of uh, 32 by 22, you have 704 nodes as input. With, with the latent space, you have 100. No. <clears throat> as we showed you before, our project was Consisting of two main sections, arm gestures for larger arm gestures and 
hand gesture. So quick problem statement of the second part of the project now is that we're trying to go from a frame from the webcam and see whether the user is performing an open palm gesture with the intention of zooming in on the presentation, or if he's doing a closed fist with the intention of zooming back out. And this is something that you can't do very well in just one step, trying to go directly from the high resolution image from the camera to a prediction, because there is a lot of redundant information in the image. So we have a processing pipeline where we pass each of these frames at runtime through the processing pipeline. We extract only the useful information and then we try to classify it based on that information to say whether the user is doing one of the two gestures that we're looking for. So this is how our processing pipeline looks like. Um, it was mostly also discussed in the previous presentation, but I'm going to go through the main steps once again. First, we would like to find a bounding box around the user's hand so we can crop out as much of the redundant information as possible. We do this based on a bit of simple geometry because we have the key points from open pose, so we know the positions of the shoulder, elbow, and wrist. And with a few computations, we can reach a decent bounding box around the hand. Next, we'd like to identify only the pixels that actually belong to the hand and not to the background. This is um, segmentation, so we're trying to segment out the skin of the user from the image. And we used three um, relatively simple and fast approaches, standard in computer vision, and just averaged out the results to try and reduce some of the noise, because none of them were actually working perfectly. Finally, to get a clearer image, we also apply a bit of morphological closing, which helps with closing the holes and removing some of the noise. So in theory, after this pipeline, we should be left with these nice, nice images of the user's hand or fist or whatever he's doing. Now, if we have this image, which is just a binary mask of relatively small size, we should be able to somehow classify what gesture the user is doing. And the first approach we used for this was a basic support vector machine or some maybe standard settings. We just gathered several hundred frames of ourselves doing the two gestures, passed them all to the processing pipeline, and we got a data set like the one in the image on the left, and then we trained this SVM, which reached an accuracy of approximately 90% on the validation set, which is pretty good. When, it, when you give it good segmented images of the user's hand or fist, it does a good job in distinguishing them. We also tried something else. We thought, do we really need machine learning for this for our particular use case? So we decided to also experiment with an approach based on gradients. More intuitively, you can see it as based on edges of the image. If you take an image of an open palm and perform edge detection, you will expect to see many vertical edges, which in turn means that you expect the horizontal component of the image gradient to be quite large because that is the one that essentially detects vertical edges. Whereas if you look at, a, at an image of a closed fist, you're going to see less vertical edges, perhaps more horizontal ones. And you might see that the vertical component of the image gradient is higher. So we just turned this into a simple rule, applied it at each frame on the segmented image, and it gives results quite similar to the ones given by ESVM, but we didn't really use any kind of learning. Of course, this is a simple approach, but it would only work for distinguishing between these two gestures. If we try to introduce more hand gestures or more signs, it definitely will not work that easily, which is why we also explore the machine learning approach. That one is more generalizable, and if you train it with more data, you can detect even more gestures. In any case, finally, it didn't work well enough for us to be able to show it to you today which is quite unfortunate. It's mainly due to segmentation, which we still haven't been able to do robustly. Given perfect conditions, perfect, um, so let's say uniform lighting, a presenter wearing long sleeves, <laughs> you get quite good images of the hand, but this doesn't really happen all the time. And in a live presentation, it's not really something you can rely on. So that's definitely what needs to be improved if we would like to get this to work. Either use more complex segmentation techniques or just try to do something else. As you can see in the images on the left, even the nice little swan in the top left, 
those don't really look like a panda. It's hard to distinguish what the user was doing based just on that. Another problem we ran into, similar to the one with the arm gesture part that um, Rodrigo talked about, is that you don't really know when to start and when to stop predicting. Because, of course, the, the presenter is going to gesticulate naturally, and he might accidentally uh, make these kind of gestures while talking, and if the camera picks them up and then starts messing around with the slides, this will definitely hurt the presentation. So that is another thing that should be investigated. Either have some kind of confidence score to determine whether the classifier has a high confidence that the user is doing that, or trying to circumvent the problem. Potential alternatives that could be explored in future work include hidden Markov models, which are widely used for gesture detection, and maybe even convolutional neural networks. Given a few thousand images of open palms and closed fists, maybe those could uh, classify well enough and you wouldn't actually have to perform the segmentation anymore. That's it for my part. Now, now we are going to explain the evaluation part of uh, this project uh, among the three models that we have out in color, heuristics, and cross correlation based. And uh, if you don't mind, I will get rid of this and uh, try to make a real uh, demo. Okay. Okay. That's still a prototype. Right? Yeah. But uh, we can also. Not visualize this top thing. The, there is where the gesture is detected is uh, shown when we read the text, but uh, we decide to make it more transparent and show you what happens. So we'll start detecting in this way. So instead, we have three models. And uh, first, we evaluate the open coder model. And where with the, as uh, Rodrigo said, we use only one single layer open coder with one, uh, 100 nodes. In the latent space, and uh, as you can see, the error was pretty low, and the reconstruction also was uh, was rely was very accurate. Uh, but no, sometimes, okay. uh, but uh, when we go when, when we extract the latent space to fit the classifier with that, uh, we got an eye loss for the classifier and uh, an eye error in the real time testing. So. Since it was not really robust, we decided not to use this for a uh, for the testing. <coughs> but <laughs> always oh, work. <laughs> You're nervous. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ah, no. Yeah, it's the animation. Okay, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, so one of the challenge was the fact that for training we use uh, we sample the training data with uh, seven per, uh, frame per second, but we tested on several computers with the different graphic cards and it makes the difference because uh, some of them was in three, one in twelve, one in seven, uh, but it doesn't really matter because of the interpolation uh, uh, Nicholas explained. So it's, it seems to be stable for the performance. Okay, just and, and for um, and for evaluating the remaining models, so a realistic space and cross correlation based approach, we uh, submitted a, a survey to the key students and uh, to check the intuitiveness of the choosers and the usability of proxy <laughs> tasks to make them to choose which one uh, is better. Of course, only for the unjustified part because, as we, uh, we said, it's not really uh, reliable for the unjustified at least for this part. Uh, okay. And um, so, uh, for, before starting the uh, make them to try to perform the gesture, we ask if they can guess which gesture we are gonna use. And for the next slide and for previous slide, because the other ones are not really uh, <coughs> intuitive, and they must be only at the beginning, at the end, or uh, for reset. So for the next slide, 88% of the tester guess it, and 63% uh, of the uh, tester guess the previous slide that I didn't do yet, but it was uh, this. Okay, and uh, for and then we ask the people to do five attempts for each uh, gesture, and uh, for both the setups, and uh, the success rate can be seen on the table. And uh, as you can see, in, on average, they are they perform quite uh, the same. Cross correlation seems to be more stable because, uh, because um, it has score always higher than three. 
Well, the, for the reset, uh, in the heuristics approach is really a bottleneck because it's 1.13. Um, uh, let's see. After, and also we have some time uh, to rate some subjective question, for example, if we find the uh, gesture intuitive, and we are happy to see that 100% uh, of people said that uh, next slide and the previous slide were uh, really intuitive. And for some stumper, we said uh, we have a lower score, and then we ask if the difficulty they had to learn the gesture. And for both the model, and it seems uh, still that cross correlation uh, performance. Uh, uh, is preferred. Also, in the second table, you can see we ask explicitly which setup was better for them, and uh, cross correlation has an highest score. Okay, but after uh, receiving some, noticing the low performance of the reset gesture and uh, receiving some feedback, we uh, noticed that <coughs> since the reset gesture was like this, it was interfering with the uh, with other gestures, so we said, okay, let's try to define a new one that it has nothing to do with the other one. Uh, I stopped uh, detecting in order to show the gesture. This crossing your hands like this, and then on the right you can see the matrix uh, representation of the gesture, and uh, this seems to work pretty stable. But I want to show you now because the reset make us to start again the presentation. I think we don't want it. And um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. you can do it with gestures. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, uh, and we uh, train it only for uh, the cross correlation approach because uh, it required really few data to do that and uh, to refine with the risk it was pretty hard. So, for the future work, for the what uh, concerned the hard gesture, probably is uh, work to explore more the encoder approach because um, before the classifier part, it seems to be uh, uh, really low error in the reconstruction when there was. Uh, where the gesture was performed and uh, an eye reconstruction error where there was no gesture. And uh, for the hand, uh, and probably we just need more data and more clean data because some was a bit noisy. And uh, for the hand gestures, um, still oh, at the bottleneck is the effective, uh, the background subtraction that seems to be um, um, uh, difficult to, to achieve. Because if we have that, then we can perform a good segmentation. And as uh, Ratman explained, the classification with a good segmented image was uh, really effective. And in general, for improvements, we just use budget one gesture for each uh, functionality, but we can have more gestures. For example, I'll uh, change the slide with ball pens or some uh, uh, other thing, and uh, add more functionality like zooming. Um, or uh, highlighting, pointing, but they are mostly, at least um, to me, I think they are more intuitive to, to be done with just fingers. I'm thinking, for example, with Zoom, we are used to pinch to Zoom on the touch screen, so probably it will be more intuitive to use them. So still, we need the background subtraction. And uh, to wrap up and start from the, to come back from, uh, to the research question, is it possible to accurately and robustly identify human gesture using only an ordinary web camera? I would say yes, because we have seen that it gives, uh, give us enough information to make a good classification. Is it possible to accurately and robustly identify human gesture even when the person stands in front of a cluttered background? Yes, but still we need this background subtraction. Um, and can a traditional classifier be used to classify gestures with, uh, given the right features, or is deep learning required? Uh, this is still open question because we use open post that is trained as a deep, learn, a deep learning question. But after that, when we get the key points, we don't use the cross correlation, it's not really a deep learning approach. Uh, so it's uh, uh, probably we still need a combination of them. And so you will probably expect that at the end of uh, the presentation, the last slide is the last slide, but we didn't show you the research gesture. So uh, thank you for your attention. And <laughs> That's <laughs> cool. Okay, no. <laughs> thank you. Question? <laughs> Very courageous, by the way, to do a live thing. Um, very good.